Um, oh, sorry about that. I just bumped the microphone. Heike, I um, I haven't had a chance to uh, look into it yet, but I will be um, getting back to you. And if um, I haven't posted everything um, that you needed, then I'll, I'll push back the uh, the due date. So so uh, totally totally don't stress. All right. Okay. Let's see. So we are. All right, we left off with a, um, well, we closed, not, not so much a cliffhanger, I, I, I gave a problem. Um, I, I spent the end of lecture on Wednesday talking about the relationship between uh, Gibbs free energy and uh, chemical reactions. We spent some time looking at the stoichiometric relationship that exists there, and then um, we spent the end of lecture talking about how, of course, um, how when you manipulate a chemical equation, how that changes, affects S's law. Okay, hang on, quick question. Um, before we start in, ah, okay, okay, totally, great, great question. Um, Bailey, and I'm going to be, uh, actually posting uh, posting about um, about this in the class. So so I so I've been teaching two lecture sections um, because uh, Dr. Mahoney has been on paternity leave, but he's back um, starting this week. So um, as of this moment in time, he's taking over the reins to your class, and um, uh, and I'll be posting about this. I know um, my my lecture. Whoops, hang on. So, whoa, I need to reduce the thickness on my pen there. All right, so my lecture, my lecture section, um, I believe, and, I, and I'll look all this up and, and, and make a post, um, is I think it's like sixteen hundred and five or something like that, and um, and then Max's um, section I don't know the exact number, it's like fifteen number number number. There might be an eight. There might be a seven. I, I haven't memorized it. Um, so if you are in. Um, uh, this lecture section, right here, the 1605, then you're in my section. If you're not, if you're in the one that's 1500 and something, um, then you're in Max's and he is now, um, back from paternity leave and he is, um, resuming, uh, or not resuming, taking kind of control, uh, for the first time. Um, so he'll be lecturing, um, he'll be handling all your assignments and stuff, um, from there on out. So questions should be emailed to him because, um, I, I no longer have uh, governance, governing power in uh, in that lecture section. Um, you are all more than welcome to like I'm. All my streams are on YouTube, so you can still, um, you know, watch my channel if it's helpful. You can come to office hours and ask me questions. Um, I'm open to to uh, everyone, um, but. Um, but I know I'm, I'm no longer the person uh, writing your tests. I'm no longer the person. Uh, with kind of the um, authority uh, in your lecture section now. So I handled the first half, he's gonna handle the second half. Um, so that being said, if you choose to watch, to tune in, because um, I'm helpful, uh, just know that if I promise something will be, okay, this is for sure gonna be on the exam, um, it may or may not be on yours. Also, in addition, he may be emphasizing different things than I emphasize, so, um, Definitely take your cues from him because he is writing your exams from here on out. He is uh, grading them, and uh, all, all that good stuff. Um, okay. So okay, wow, we got a flurry on the uh, live chat. So so Bailey, so that so the, to answer your question, um, yes, he. So, so, um, 
Okay, okay, no, no, so Bailey, you're already in his class on Canvas. The Canvas course that I've been interacting with you and posting things to that your grades are in, um, that is his Canvas course. Um, we're both, you'll, you'll actually, if you look us up under under the people tab in um, in that class, you'll notice we're both listed as professors. So you don't need to add a class, you don't need to transition to a different Canvas page. It'll all be in the same place that all of my posts have been going to. Um, it's just he's now uh, taking over that section, but you don't need to transfer or get into any um, anything else. You're, you're, it'll just be in the same place that it already, always has been. Um, Jenna, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, Um, Jenna, you are not the only uh, the only one. Kate was um, was uh, brought that up as well. I will figure out all that's going on there, and I know that it's due today, so I'll, I'll bump that due date um, back for you. So um, so yeah, so don't don't stress about that. I'll I'll get to the bottom of it and figure it out. Probably uh, tonight I should be posting something. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, Kiev, yeah, they're, um, or Kiev, sorry, I don't know why I say Kiev, Kiev's a city in Russia. Um, um for exam security reasons, um, Kiev, Kiev you, you don't actually get to see your results on the exam, um, uh, due to problems that we've had in the past with students leaking stuff to sites uh, that, um, yeah, totally. Um, lab 5 worksheet 2 this Thursday. Amanda, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but um, check your uh, lab campus. Um, ba -dum -bum -bum. Yeah, uh, Amanda, if that's what the directions say to do, then that is totally what you do. Um, okay. All right. So that, so let's go ahead and uh, get rolling on um, lecture. Um, so we, I, I left off with a, um, with a problem for us to solve, but but before we take a moment to um, to work the problem to get an answer, um, I want to. Um, I got a little bit ahead of myself. There's something that I wanted to um, discuss. Um, uh, uh, Jen, if I bump the due date back, I'll bump the quiz back as well. It'll be everything for lab four. We'll get pushed back. Um, all right, so there's one thing I wanted to talk about before we dive into this problem. I got a little bit ahead of myself um, writing it up, and I, and I just want to dial things back for a minute um, so that we can talk about Hess's Law. All right, um, Hess's Law is um, integral to our uh, understanding and exploration of delta H, right, change in enthalpy. And um, Hess's law states the following. Um, change in enthalpy is a, you are so welcome. Ch uh, change in enthalpy is a state function and is therefore independent of path. All right, change in enthalpy is a state function and is therefore independent of 
path. All right. So um, this uh, law, this definition, um, sounds confusing, right? It's 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 hard to understand. You're you're going well. What's a good question to ask? Is um, is what is a state function? All right. What is a state function? Um, now, so here's here's uh, an example of a state function. Um, being at a concert back when we were allowed to go to those, right? Pre uh, COVID-19. Um, being at a concert is an example of a state function. All right. There are many ways to get to a concert. All right. There's many ways to get to a concert. You could um, buy your ticket through a, uh, a fan club presale. You could uh, buy your ticket during the general sales. You could buy it after the fact from StubHub. You could buy a ticket off a of scalper. Um, you could even sneak into the venue, right? Where's my hand? There, it's on the camera. Sneak into the venue. Those are all different ways to get to a concert, but everybody who's at the concert is there and being at the concert is path independent, all right? Being at the show, we're all there. It doesn't matter how we got there, we're there. That is what a state function is. Now, arriving at the concert is not a state function because you could drive. Maybe you live close enough to ride your bike or walk. You could Uber. Some people travel by plane from out of town to make it to a show because it's special for whatever reasons. So getting to a concert is not a state function because Getting to a show d is path dependent. It depends upon the means you use to get there. But being at the show is a state function. And the brass tacks, what Hess's Law tells us is it does not matter how you calculate delta H, how you calculate change in enthalpy, if you can arrive at an answer, that answer is true. It doesn't matter how you calculate it, if you get to that final answer, that is going to be the delta H. So you can use, this is what allows us to use manipulating reactions that have nothing to do with the one we're asking about. If you manipulate those other reactions and you can add them together and multiply all by a factor and crunch them together, cancel all you need to cancel, you can take reactions that are easy to study and use them to determine the delta H of a reaction that's harder to study. And that is exactly what we're doing in this example. All right. Um, so this is, this is a Hess's law example. All right, so um, I'm going to, uh, to rewrite that problem. So we need to find, so, so we're, we're given a chemical equation, one in which solid carbon reacts with, um, oh wait, no, 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 where's the, solid carbon reacts with water. I need a much bigger eraser. There we go. Solid carbon reacts with water vapor, H2O gas, to produce carbon dioxide gas and hydrogen gas. All right. Um, and we want to, we're being asked to find what is the delta H for this reaction? What is the change in enthalpy um, for this reaction? All right, and, um, and we're given, so let's look at what we're given. We're given three chemical equations um, each with a delta H. So we have the combustion of solid carbon to produce carbon dioxide. All right, and this reaction has a change in enthalpy of negative 393.5. Five kilojoules per mole. Um, we have the combustion of carbon monoxide gas, so carbon monoxide reacting with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. 
this reaction has a delta H of negative 566.0 kilojoules per mole. Um, and then finally, we have um, hydrogen reacting with oxygen to produce water. Um, and this reaction has a change in enthalpy of negative 483.6 kilojoules per mole. All right, now the strategy, and this is, this is how you want to um, attack these problems. So here's how we're going to tackle it. Um, you want to manipulate the given equations or manipulate the given equations so that the reactants and products um, of the desired equation are in place and everything else cancels. And we're going to focus on everything else canceling at the very end. First, we want to make sure that we've placed um, all of our reactants and products where they need to be. All right, so when you first look at this, so for example, um, you want to, so, so let's look at our reactants, okay? Let's look at our reactants and start making the list. So the first one is... We want solid carbon on the reactant side, and we specifically want one mole of solid carbon on the reactant side. And you can see that our first reaction has one mole of solid carbon on the reactant side. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to take that first equation and kind of add it to our list, all right? So we're going to make a list of all of our equations um, that we're using. And we are going to use solid carbon reacting with O2 gas to produce carbon dioxide. And this is a delta H. Because at the end, we're going to add all these together, add all of our delta H's, and come out with our answer. So our delta H is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, Kate. I see your question. Um, um, almost always, uh, you'll see delta H's with uh, most frequently kilojoules per mole. Um, sometimes you'll see calories or kilocalories, they're called kcals per mole. Um, but uh, delta H um, of it'll always have units of some energy unit per mole and even there's a there's a um a worksheet uh, so sometimes you'll see it just written as delta h it always has a per mole sorry sometimes you'll see delta h is written as just kilojoules but there will always be a per mole um value so, um, but, but it could be any energy unit per mole. All right, so we've got this first one on the list. Now let's go back and look at, um, at our, our uh, the reactions we have to choose from. You'll notice that, nope, that we have one 
mole of carbon right in place that's where we wanted it um you'll notice so let's 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 find uh water now we want to have one mole of h2o um, on our reactant side and you'll notice that the reaction that has water has water there's two problems one it's on the product side and two there's two moles and we need just one so we need to do some manipulation to that last um, that last equation all right so I'm gonna rewrite it here the combustion of hydrogen we've got two moles of H2 gas plus O2 producing water vapor, H2O. Um, now, oh wait, here, we gotta write our delta H. Delta H for this reaction is negative 43.6 kilojoules per mole. All right, now the first thing we gotta do here is we need to flip flip this reaction, right? The reason why we're flipping it is because we need water on the react, oops, sorry, I meant for that to come out in blue. Um, we need water on the reactant side and right now it's on the product side. So we're going to flip it, we're gonna exchange the reactants in the product, so rewriting the equation is two moles of water vapor decomposing into two moles of hydrogen gas and one mole of oxygen gas, we can do that. And the way that delta H is affected is whenever you flip a reaction, um, it gets the opposite sign. So now the ch change in enthalpy for this flipped reaction is a positive 483.6 kilojoules per mole. All right, now the second thing, so you'll notice we have water on the correct side, but now the problem is we have two moles of water in this reaction, but the reaction we're investigating, the reaction that we want to calculate a delta H for only has one mole of water. So we need to multiply now everything in this flipped reaction by one half. And when we do that, we're going to get one mole of H2O produces one mole of H2 plus one half mole of O2, all right? And this delta H, we have to cut our delta H in half. So 483.6 divided by two is 241.8 kilojoules per mole, all right? Now, if you are concerned by the fact that we have a fraction in our balanced chemical equation, you may be going, wait a minute, Josh, you told us that you can never have a fraction, right, in a balanced chemical equation, they gotta be integer values, um, and all of that still holds, but I'd like you to remember when we've used fractions before in balanced chemical equations, right? We've done it this semester in order to balance, and at the end, we always get rid of the fractions in the last step, right? That'll hold true. You're allowed to introduce them, you just can't keep them, all right? It's like that super cool alien creature in a science fiction movie that the main character discovers and keeps as a pet and loves it so much, but then by the end, it's gotta go back to its own people, right? That's those cool fraction integers in our balanced chemical, they're not fraction integers, that's not a thing. Fraction coefficients, they're super cool, they help us get where we're going, but at the end, we gotta, we gotta set them free. So, don't be disturbed, we're gonna take care of it, but you always wait till the end. All right, let's take a look at this now. So we're gonna add this, um, we're gonna add this equation now to our list of keepers. So we've got our first one, right, now, Let's write our reaction for H2O, whoops. Here we go, H2O. Oh, no, I don't want that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, H2O, water vapor. 
um, produces H2 gas plus one half a mole of O2 gas. And the delta H here is 241.8 kilojoules per mole. All right, so we've got two things in place now. We've got um, we've got carbon taken care of. We've got water. Now let's take a look at CO two. Um, uh, Karen Veer, I have not graded the free response stuff, so the free response has to be graded later. All right, so let's take a look. We've identified where carbon is. We've identified where water is. Let's take a look at um, at uh, well H two for example. So hydrogen. Oops. Where are, here we go. Hydrogen is right here, right? It's on the product side, and we only have one mole of hydrogen. You'll notice we've got two problems. We need hydrogen on the product side. In this reaction, it's on the reactant side, and there's only one mole of, oh wait, we've actually taken care of hydrogen. If you look at our work in the previous problem, oh wait, not there, but here, um, we actually have hydrogen taken care of, right? Because we got hydrogen there and hydrogen there. So now we gotta figure out carbon dioxide. Now check this out. Carbon dioxide is here. We need one mole of it being produced, and you'll notice that we have one mole of it being produced right here on the product side. So we actually, at this moment in time, have water, we have solid carbon, and we have hydrogen. We have all our reactants and products lined up. What's wrong? All right, now what's wrong here is you'll notice that we have an oxygen problem. We have one half a mole of O2 here, and it will not cancel with our one mole of oxygen there. So we need to come up with um, some oxygen to cancel in this situation. And there's only one reaction left. You'll recall, so I'm going to write this down here. The one reaction we have left here is the reaction of, oh, snap. Hang on. I wrote our original problem wrong. I was like, something doesn't feel right. Um, in our original problem. This is not carbon dioxide, it's carbon monoxide. CO2. No, I just did the same mistake. It's carbon monoxide. There we go. Let's get rid of this. Um, yellow under here. And we should get rid of this circling of the oxygen. All right, we'll deal with that O2 gas, but we don't have to confront it right at this moment. We do have one more reactant that we need to handle, and uh, or product, I, I guess I should say, um, and that product is our CO, our carbon monoxide, all right? So let's look at our, our three, oh, sorry about that, our three equations, carbon monoxide, we need one mole of carbon monoxide on the product side of this reaction. And you'll notice that we have two moles on our reactant side. So we need to manipulate this equation to get carbon monoxide where it belongs. So let's go ahead and do that now. So, rid of 
this yellow blob. We'll be off to the races. So the reaction with carbon monoxide um, is two moles of carbon monoxide gas react with one mole of oxygen gas to produce two moles of CO2. And our delta H here is rather large. It's negative 566.0 kilojoules per mole. All right, now first, we need carbon monoxide on the product side, so we are going to flip this reaction. So we get two moles of carbon dioxide gas decomposing into two moles of carbon monoxide and one mole of oxygen. And again, just like last time, whenever you flip a chemical equation, the delta H has the same value, but opposite sign. So this is 566.0 kilojoules per mole. All right, now we need, as we can see, only one mole, oh wait, not of CO2, we don't care about that. We need one mole of carbon monoxide. So we are gonna take this reaction and multiply everything by one half. All right, so this will be CO2 producing CO plus one half O2. And this will cut our delta H in half as well. So we go 566 divided by two is 283.0 kilojoules per mole. And this is the equation that we're going to add to our growing list. All right, so now we have CO2 producing um, carbon monoxide plus one half O2. And this delta H is 283.0 kilojoules per mole. All right, now we need to add, now that we have everything in place right all our reactants in place um we need to make we need to add these all together and make sure that everything we don't want in our reaction cancels and one thing you'll notice is we have one mole of carbon monoxide on the reactant side oh, sorry carbon dioxide and one mole of carbon dioxide on the product side so these two cancel which is good because carbon dioxide is not in the reaction we're trying to find a delta H for. The second thing you'll notice is you have one mole of O2 gas on the reactants side, and then you have one half and another half of O2 on the product side. And you'll notice that one half plus one half is one, so all of our oxygen cancels as well. This leaves us with only solid carbon and water vapor on the product side, and it leaves us with carbon monoxide and hydrogen on the, uh, sorry, carbon monoxide and hydrogen on the product side, carbon and water vapor on the reactant side. Now. To find our delta H for this reaction, we add the individual delta H's for each react reaction that we added together. So we got um, 
What's that? 393.5, that's a negative 393.5, plus 241.8, plus 283.0. Um, so our delta H comes out to be 131.3 kilojoules per mole. You'll notice that sig figs wise, we did an addition slash subtraction. All of our numbers have their last significant digit in the first decimal place and our answer does as well. So we don't need to round, um, we don't need to add. All right, <laughs> round. We don't need to round, we don't need to add any zeros to the mix all right and i want to point out the reason why we're doing this is this particular reaction this reaction between solid carbon and water vapor to produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas is incredibly slow this reaction is very hard to study but the three reactions that we used were all combustions combustions are fast easy to measure easy to study and so we can use bomb calorimetry to measure the delta H for each of those combustions, but we can't use bomb calorimetry for this reaction because it's so slow. But we can use Hess's law to take those three combustion reactions and derive what the delta H for this reaction is. So that is the power of Hess's law. It lets us take data, unrelated data, and use it, bring it in to calculate um, changes in enthalpy for reactions that are more challenging to study. All right, now, um, and this is where we get to the, this is the first time I've been self-conscious saying something like this um, in lecture. Uh, this is a type of problem that you can expect to um, encounter at least once, possibly multiple times on exam three that only applies if you're in my section. Max may include it too, but I, I have no, I have no control, no jurisdiction there. So, um, so definitely expect this to show up. Um, at least once, possibly multiple times, this type of problem um, on the exam. Yes, Jared, that is 100% correct. Always. Um, there's no way I would like give you a chemical reaction equation um, and say, um, you know, Use Hess's law to find it and not give you anything else. I would give you the equations you need to manipulate um, as well. I think something else that's worth pointing out is um, for these reactions. Yeah, totally, because it, it'd be impossible to solve. Otherwise, and I don't expect you to like be able to go out and find, oh, I need these equations to manipulate them together. Um, something I should also point out is on the test, um, I could do a problem like this, um, and uh, the value that you calculate may not be accurate in this sense. Um, because you can look up the delta H for almost any chemical equation, it's out there. So the delta H's for the rea equations that I'm going to give you to manipulate won't necessarily be the correct values for them. And so the final number that you calculate won't necessarily be the value that you'd look up in a book, right? Because I'm not testing, because because the thing is, you're taking a test online, you could just Google, what's the delta H for the reaction of carbon and water with carbon monoxide, to produce carbon monoxide and H2, and possibly get a value, and the value you'd come up with would be this, 131.3. Um, on the exam, what I would do is I'd use a real reaction and use three real reactions as well, like these, but I would change the numbers so that the correct answer would be impossible for you to look up. So that's something you should be aware of too, um, that for this type of reaction, don't use the correct value you could find in your textbook or on the internet, because that would not be the answer to the problem given the values, the data that I'm gonna provide. So, so that's something to be aware of as well. Um, Cause I'm not testing, can you tell me what this is? I'm testing, can you use this principle, this concept, to solve this type of problem? All right. Now, possibly the um, most important application of Hess's law um, comes into play um, when we start talking about uh, change in enthalpy of formation reactions. All right. This is, um, 
I would argue the most useful application of Hess's law would be the change in enthalpy, the standard change in enthalpy of formation reactions. All right, so um, let's break this symbol down a little bit. All right. Um, We, we know what this is, right? This is change in enthalpy. Which gives us a ratio of the energy either released or absorbed in a reaction um, and the quantity in moles, the molar quantities present in that balanced chemical equation. Um, but what did this subscript and superscript mean? This F means that you're dealing with a formation reaction. Well, I don't know why I made that an R. Formation. Oh, because the next thing is reaction. Um, and then this little circle up here, it's called a knot. Um... You see it in uh, calculus and physics, you use those knots a lot. If you haven't had calculus or physics, you may be unfamiliar with it. Here in a, um, in a chemical context, this knot means um, that uh, everything is um, under standard conditions. Um, standard conditions or that all the reactants and products are in their standard state is what we should say. All right. So, um, so we've got to define some of these things. We've got to define formation reactions. We know change enthalpy, but Delta H, this is the standard enthalpy of formation. The, uh, change in enthalpy of a formation reaction where every reactant and product are in their standard states. All right, so first, what is a formation reaction? Formation reaction. A formation reaction is, all right, um, by definition, the formation of one mole um, the formation of one mole uh, of a compound one mole of a compound from its constituent elements Um, in their, and here it comes up again, standard state. So you're forming a compound from its simple, most, oh, I was about to say elementary elements. That just sounds redundant. Um, from its basic elements. So like, for example, um, <laughs> sorry. I just realized I was like, so like, I'm, that's, that's me at my most Southern Californian right there. Uh, born and raised. Spent some time in New York though, so that's where I acquired my edge. So if you were to write the standard, uh, or sorry, a formation reaction for carbon dioxide, which is a compound, it would have to form, you'd have to form one mole of carbon dioxide from elemental carbon, solid, plus elemental oxygen, which is a gas, all right? So this would be the 
formation reaction for CO2. Um, I want to dig into a little bit, before we go deeper, into the meaning of the standard state. I actually give it some parameters, give you um, kind of a handle on that situation. So let's, let's talk for a second about um, the standard state or standard um, states, I should say. All right, so standard states. Um, if we're talking about a gas, the standard state of a gas is, um, it exists under one atmosphere um, of pressure. All right, um, for a liquid, a liquid standard state, um, or actually, sorry, a liquid or a solid. So a liquid slash solid um, in their standard state um, are stable um, at one atmosphere and 25 degrees C. Um, and then for the aqueous state, oops, um, a compound in the aqueous phase is in its standard state when it has a concentration uh, of one molar. All right, so that's what it means to be in its standard state. Gas, you're under one pressure of atmosphere. Liquid or solid, you got to be stable at one atmosphere of pressure in 25 degrees C. If you're aqueous, your concentration is one molar. So, um, so a standard enthalpy change um, If you have a standard enthalpy change, it's symbolized like this. And that knot right here means all reactants and products are in their standard state. All right, and then the, now bringing it all kind of back home, the standard change in enthalpy for of a formation reaction is all of this, all this applies, it is a standard enthalpy but specifically for a formation reaction. For a reaction where you're producing um, uh, one mole of product, all right? Now, you may be, okay, so I've been belaboring this point, right? And you may be going, okay, what's the deal? Why, why, why am I still talking about this? And here's why this is critical, all right? Um, This is, this is really the linchpin. So a pure element in its standard state has an enthalpy of zero. A pure element in its standard state has an enthalpy of zero, all right? Here's what that means. If you've got a pure 
element, right? So not a compound, just that molecule, that not that molecule, that element by itself in its standard state, that is the lowest energy state possible for that element if it's pure and in its standard state. It can't, that's as low an energy as it can get. So its enthalpy is zero, not change in, but absolute enthalpy is zero. Here's why this is important, all right? So, again, just to reiterate this, it has an H of zero kilojoules per mole. With this in mind, let's consider the following reaction. The reaction between um, the formation reaction of CH4. All right, so it's the reaction of one mole of graphite, solid carbon, and two moles of H2 gas to produce one mole of CH4. All right. We can measure the delta H for this reaction. The delta H of this formation reaction under standard conditions um, is negative 74.6 kilojoules per mole. All right, I want you to think for a minute about what this change in enthalpy is specifically I want you to zero in on the delta delta means change in right it means final minus initial for a reaction final is the enthalpy of the products initial is the enthalpy of the reactants right final is the delta h for the products or sorry the enthalpy of the products initial is the enthalpy for the reactants it's final minus initial for this specific reaction it's going to be delta h the product sole product is ch4 minus the enthalpy for carbon plus the enthalpy i should say plus two to the enthalpy for hydrogen. All right, so you could say that the delta H of this formation reaction is equal to, I'm just gonna rewrite this here so it's consolidated. It's the enthalpy of our final product minus the enthalpy, the sum of the enthalpies of our initial reactants. But notice something. We are under standard conditions. And a pure element in its standard state has an enthalpy of zero. So the enthalpy of carbon is zero. And the enthalpy of hydrogen is also zero. So that means that the pure standalone enthalpy for CH4 is equal to the change in enthalpy of the formation reaction for methane. All right, now here's the deal. It's hard to measure absolute enthalpies, but when you do it for a formation reaction, when you measure the change in enthalpy, that is the absolute enthalpy of the product that's formed because it is the only product that's formed and it's formed from pure elements in their standard states which have enthalpies of zero here's why this is powerful all right this is why this matters it matters because the change in enthalpy of formation reactions in standard states gives you an 
the absolute enthalpy of the product that is formed under standard conditions. And that's clutch here. This is only true when we're talking about standard conditions. All right, now. Mm. Emma, excellent question. The answer is yes. And so Emma just asked a great question. If an element is bonded to itself, um, is it still a pure element because it's diatomic? And yes, like O2, N2, um, Cl2, um, those elements, their elemental form is molecular. So they still have um, an absolute enthalpy of zero. Absolutely. So um, that's why I actually corrected myself. I tripped up. I was like, um, if you have an element and it's, you know, pure form. I think I said something about um, you have all, like none of the, I, I can't remember exactly. Earlier in here, if you want to catch me in a faux pas, I think I called, I said molecule inappropriately and I corrected myself because some elements are molecular. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. So O2, it's O2 is still the elemental form. N2 is the elemental form. Um, and they all have absolute enthalpies of zero, which allow us, to use them in calculations. Now, here's the power of the delta H of formation reactions. In your book, um, there is a uh, gigantic table of delta H of formation reactions. All right, and um, so so, and they allow you to solve problems like the following. All right. Um, like the following. Calculate the change in enthalpy for standard conditions for the following reaction. All right, and um, the reaction I'm going to give us is the combustion of uh, methane. If any of you cooked on a stovetop this morning, um, you did this reaction because CH4 is natural gas. H2O, and that is a gas as well. Water vapor. Okay, so now here's the deal. When you're doing a problem like this, you can find as long, and this is the, the catch, um, as long as you're under standard conditions, you can use delta H of formation reactions, all right? The delta H of formation, or sorry, of your reaction will equal, is equal to the sum of all the delta H of formations for your react, uh, sorry, products. It's products minus react. It's final minus initial. Minus the sum of all of the delta H of formations for your reactants. All right, these problems are so much easier to do than, um, excuse me, than um, 
the previous Hess's Law problems where you had to manipulate all these equations because all you have to do to, uh, to solve these problems um, is you need to, all you need to do is look up the delta H of formation oops, um, for all of these reactants and products. You just look them up and then you plug them into this equation. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh man, that is the worst. I just, you just saw me live. I had to sneeze. You know that feeling when you have to sneeze and then you don't? That just happened to me in a live stream. It's the first time for everything. All right, so what you are gonna do in your book is you need to find the table for all the change in enthalpy of formation reactions um, for each of these, uh, for each reactant and product. Look them up and then use this equation to solve them. Now, um, on the exam, you will not have to look them up. I'll provide the delta H informations for you in the problem if that's um, the type of problem that you're doing. Um, but here, I'll, I'll give them to you. So, methane has a delta H of formation of um, negative 70, 76.4 um, kilojoules per mole. Um, water, for water, it's negative 241, uh, negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. Um, carbon dioxide is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Um, and now you'll search and search and search, but nowhere will you find O2 in a table. And if you're doing a problem and you find yourself stuck, like I can't find this one reactant or product, ask yourself, is it an element? Because if it is, the then it's enthalpy well, is zero kilojoules per mole, right? Um, an el a uh, substance in its elemental form under standard conditions uh, has an absolute enthalpy of zero. So if you find you're searching for something, can't find it, double check. If it's an element, then you just use zero. All right, now that we know the delta H of formation reactions for, um, for each of our reactants and our products, we can begin our calculation for the change in enthalpy for this reaction. Um, Lucas, you can look it up in the, uh, or here, I'll, I'll type this. Um, um, uh, in the uh, TRO textbook, um, Lucas, you can look it up in the Tro textbook, or you can do a Google Google image search. You'll find that um, that uh, there are just just search uh, change in enthalpy of formation reaction table, um, and you'll you'll get hit with a bunch of examples. Um, they're they're everywhere. There is one in the Tro textbook, but any one that you find online will will suffice. But no table that you come across will have a value for an element because those all have enthalpies of zero. So 
Yeah, yeah, you are totally welcome, dude. So first, we gotta go, we gotta add up the Delta H for all of our products. And you'll notice, so we're gonna take, I'm just gonna write this out. Um, the Delta H, a formation of carbon dioxide under standard conditions plus, and I really wanna emphasize this, two times the Delta H of formation of water under standard conditions. The reason why this is two is because you'll notice in this chemical equation, um, you get two moles of water. You make two moles of water. And remember, the definition of a formation reaction is the formation of one mole, right? One mole of product. So that delta H of formation tells you how much energy is released when one mole of water is produced, but this reaction produces two, okay? So you've got to include that in your calculation, all right? So that's, uh, those are our reactants. Let's take a look. Sorry, those are products. Thanks for bearing with me. Let's take a look at our reactants. So we're gonna go minus um, the change in enthalpy for uh, methane for the formation of methane. And then technically, we do need to multiply this by two, two times the delta H of formation of O2, which is zero because oxygen O2 is in its elemental form. O2 doesn't form because it's the most basic version of oxygen we have. It is a delta H of zero. So now let's plug in our numbers. So carbon dioxide is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole plus two times um, water, negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole minus, open parentheses, um, methane, which is negative 76.4 kilojoules per mole. And then again, oxygen doesn't have uh, a value for the delta H formation because it's an element. Um, so, let's see. Let's multiply 241.8, oh wait, 241.8, that's negative times two. So this is equal to negative 393.5 minus 483.6 plus, right, because we got a negative times a negative, 76.4. So, Let's add these all together. And we get negative 800.7 kilojoules per mole is the change in enthalpy for this reaction. All right, so the huge advantage that delta H of formation reactions provide us um, is that, uh, that they're easy. It's like you look up the numbers, you plug them in, you add up all of your products, subtract the sum of all your reactants, and there you go. There's one wrinkle to this is you gotta remember that if you're producing two or three or four, if you've got some stoichiometric other than one, stoichiometric coefficient other than one, you gotta remember to multiply your delta H formation by that coefficient, right? Because the formation reaction gives you the energy value for forming one mole. So if there's multiple moles, you gotta take that into consideration. Um, another downside is this only applies for reactions whose reactants and products are all in the standard state. Often this is the case, but not always. Sometimes reactions are taking place under higher pressure 
or higher temperature or at a different concentration. So you're, it's limited by that, but it's got a wide utility um, and it's much easier than uh, our first application of Hess's law. There's one last thing that I want to uh, kind of caution you about um, or kind of give you a warning, give you a, um, I'm going to issue a caveat emptor. All right, those of you uh, who are unfamiliar um, with this phrase, um, it's Latin for buyer's beware. All right, this is a this is a warning because this mistake is very easy to fall into, and I actually I don't have this in my notes, so I'm. I'm going rogue here. All right. So let's see. Okay, yep, this is exactly. So when you're using these tables, you have to be careful, all right? You've gotta be careful because these values are specific, not just to the molecule you're looking up, but also its phase. You'll notice that there are actually two delta H affirmation values for water. I think this is the, the best example of a broader phenomenon. It's not just water you have to worry about this with. Um, but if you glance at a table with delta H's affirmation, you'll see two values. One will say negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole and the other will give you a value uh, where was it there we go negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole and this may be confusing especially right at first you may be going what's going on why um, and if and you may just blindly grab one do the problem punch in your answer um, the first one is the delta H of formation for one mole of water in the gas phase. The second is the delta H of formation of one mole of water in the liquid phase. So the thing you have to keep in mind is your values for the change in enthalpy of formation reactions under standard conditions are phase specific. And if you're not careful and you just grab a value out of a table, um, you may grab the wrong value for water and therefore calculate the wrong final answer and, um, and then be out of luck. So please be careful as you're selecting these. Um, sometimes you'll see multiple entries that's because when a one mole of a molecule forms in one phase, it'll take a, release a different amount of energy than if it forms in another phase, all right? So be aware of that as you're using these. Um, don't just blindly grab them, but pay attention to the details. All right, this brings us to the end of chapter six. Um, we have covered all the stuff. Um, rather than start in with chapter seven, we, we only have five minutes of lecture anyway. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put a pin in it there. So we'll pause here. We'll pick up on Wednesday with chapter seven. Um, we'll begin a discussion of, uh, of electronic structure um, 
and uh, we'll look at light. We'll start looking at electron configurations, which is where we're headed, which will eventually get us to uh, Lewis structures and kind of a discussion of, we're going to start with atomic structure and then move to molecular structure, and um, that'll close out the semester. We're, we're, we're halfway through this thing now. So anyways, thanks everyone for hanging out. I will, uh, for those of you in my lab section, I will get back. Uh, to you with answers. Jared, you are so totally welcome. Thanks for hanging out. And um, and uh, I'll see some of you tonight in office hours, and the rest I'll catch uh, Wednesday for lecture.